All right. Um, welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you're here. Um, and I'm glad to see people are already introducing themselves in the chat. We have lots of folks here from Plymouth State, and we'd love to hear what you do at Plymouth. But we also have lots of folks from around the country and around the world. So um, please, by all means, tell us who you are and where you're joining us from, um, because it's fun. It's fun to hear. I'm going to, um, unless, you know, something goes desperately south, I'm going to keep the chat open and you can feel free to use it to back channel um, through the talk. And, and uh, I don't think Trevor will keep an eye on it, but um, Martha and I will, will monitor that so that we can, you can throw questions in there or just chat with each other. And there will be time at the end of the session um, for questions directly with, with Trevor. So let me start with a very short introduction before we get to the reason that you're here. Um, I'm really excited that we have with us today, Dr. Trevor Durbin, whose research revolves around two loosely related questions. And in uh, this next section here, um, I'm gonna go ahead and quote from his bio, and I'm not gonna quote from the whole thing, but I'm putting his bio in the chat because it's a really, it's really wonderful um, the way he's, he's crafted his bio. But the questions that he's interested in first, how are humans and non-humans attempting to survive and even thrive in a time of large scale and often intense environmental change? And these changes are associated with economic, technological and political shifts that communities negotiate and individuals engage ethically and emotionally. And a second question that he explores in his work is how the human sciences can facilitate practical solutions to urgent problems. Um, these are things that are very much on the mind at, of uh, faculty at Plymouth State, where we not only have a freshman seminar called Tackling a Wicked Problem, which is very much about large scale complex um, uh, problems and how you might engage with them. Uh, but we also have a new climate studies um, major and very active meteorology and environmental science programs. Um, and we do just lots of environmental work as a, as a campus and a community. So we're really excited to explore some of the issues um, that Trevor looks at. And um, I will say that it was maybe just about a year ago that I believe it was Martha, my colleague, Martha Burtis, who brought an article, a, a 2015 article. We were just a little, a little late to the party that Trevor wrote called Loving, Eating, Teaching and Wayfaring in the Anthropocene. And um, it absolutely captured our imaginations because it, it really combined our work in pedagogy with some of the stuff, I was just going to put that in the chat, but look, Martha Burtis, she's so she's so quick. It's a fantastic article, and I would um, encourage you to follow up on this talk by by checking it out. But that was really what made us um, excited about Trevor. And then I remember talking to Abby Good, who teaches in our sustainability program, and Abby said, "I know that guy. He's fantastic." And it just all seemed like fate. So we decided to invite him to talk both to faculty and, of course. Um, to whatever students might be with us tonight. Um, so we're really excited to hear his point of view. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Trevor. And Trevor, I'll tell you that I'll just interrupt if there's any technical issues. But other than that, just uh, just go for it. We're glad you're here. Wonderful. Thank you, Robin, um, for um, reminding me what's in my bio. <laughs> um, uh, absolutely. I. This is something I've been... Um, thinking about for a while, but mostly in, uh, with students. Um, and I, I'm excited to be here to, to revisit it. I, it. The timing is actually great because I'm in the middle of sort of recrafting this class that I've been teaching for about eight years now. So um, yeah, and I wanna thank everybody else who's made this happen for the invitation to Robin, to Abby Good, uh, um, whose book is uh, at, the top of my reading list right now. Uh, so check that out if you don't know about it. Um, okay, so I, I wanna start right here. Um, this is a picture I took on Tuesday of this week uh, in a class uh, called Introduction to Medical Anthropology and Global Health. So I'm also a medical anthropologist. And I show this photo because I feel really comfortable in this environment um, at this point. So uh, I, I feel like the syllabus, it's pretty standard, but good. It introduces uh, a lot of the big ideas 
and concepts that students should know if they're familiar, want to be familiar with medical anthropology. Um, and I'm pretty comfortable with students considering me an expert um, in this space. Uh, it's just sort of nothing super special about it. I think it's just a good solid course. Um, but teaching about planetary crisis feels very different for me um, in a lot of ways. One, um, I can know, know the literature and, and what we're all saying and struggling, but the experts seem to be struggling with the same things that everybody else is struggling with, especially when it comes to practical um, actions, right? We know that we need to keep the carbon in the ground. Uh, we're doing our best. Uh, and we need to support those efforts. But then there are all these other things that we have to do to be successful, creative uh, things, restructuring the way uh, we do the economy and ecology and, and all sorts of things. And in this space, when I go in front of students, um, I don't feel like an expert. Uh, if anything, I feel like I'm struggling along with them, especially when it comes to working through a lot of the emotional baggage and trauma that comes with losing an entire world and realizing the world my children are going to grow up in is not the one I did. Um, and so processing all this grief, uh, trauma, anxiety, despair at times. Um, and so it's, it's just a very different uh, experience for me, unlike any of the other classes. And if there's anything I've come away with um, and I don't know if I've come away with anything really profound. It's uh, a very modest lesson, I think, which is I, I truly believe an undergraduate class um, should be like a really good candidate for a place to think about uh, how to live in an age of planetary crisis um, and also to do serious experimentation with it. Um, and here I'm sort of comparing it to some of these really cool third space uh, projects where we have, you know, scholars and artists and uh, students and people in the public working together to find creative solutions and so forth. Um, an example of this would be a really cool project of my mentors, Dominic Boyer and Simone Howe did, where they created the world's first funeral for a glacier, the Oak Glacier in Iceland. And they brought together all sorts of people and it really took off in the media right? Um, because it was this way of mourning the passing of this ancient um, part of their landscape. And I think an undergraduate class should not be sort of a second race rate place to do this sort of work. I think it should be up there with all of these other cool experimental places and uh, projects. Okay, so this talk is going to be in four parts. Uh, the first one is going to talk about my failure as a teacher uh, when I first started teaching this class in about 2018, actually almost exactly eight years ago. Um, and then the other three parts are going to deal with sort of the diagnosis, what we came to understand as the problems, um, and also um, what we tried to do about it. And in each case, what we tried to do about it was metaphor work, trying to recraft what our structural metaphors might be um, in that particular case, because what the way we were thinking wasn't working. So in the first part, we're gonna talk about failure, and then we're gonna talk about um, agency and a lack of agency, and how maybe the metaphor of wayfaring uh, has helped us. Uh, part three, trying to rethink how we can imagine uh, the future, and especially how the individual, um, how, we as individuals can imagine making a good impact on the future. It's very interesting to me that we have no trouble thinking about how our individual actions are destroying the world. Like I drive my car, I buy a plane ticket, but the opposite is not true, right? Um, we find it very hard to think about how our positive actions can make a positive uh, or a better future. And with that, we turn to this problem of grief and despair and what uh, an adequate hope uh, in the Anthropocene might be. And here I turn to two metaphors because this is like the very horizontal edge of the class right now. Um, and that is uh, broken jars and weeds. So part one.
So when I first started teaching this class, I was a PhD candidate at Rice, uh, along with uh, Abby, uh, we're both students there. Um, and by the end of that course, I had defended my dissertation. So with that in mind, you can sort of imagine what the syllabus would look like. It was like a mini grad school course, right? Which is okay. It was actually a solid class, I think, uh, from that perspective. It was an upper division class. It was split grad, undergrad. And uh, we engaged like really seriously with the literature. I threw in some popular stuff, but we really engaged with the literature that was important at the time. Uh, not just in environmental anthropology, but in the broader environmental human sciences as well. And from the first part of this description, you can see that, yeah, we're focusing on the scholarly literature and then like all these problems, right? Um, climate change, species extinction, and so forth. And students uh, engaged with this reading in class discussions, but also in a blog, a collective blog. And they did a really good job. Um, I just went back and read some of it uh, before this talk, and I was impressed. Uh, if you just if ignored the substantive content, this is like what we would want for any class, right? They were really struggling to understand. They were applying the concepts. They were integrating them. And I thought everything was going really great. I was really proud of myself. Um, and then one of the best students I've ever had um, posted this uh, random post number one. There was no random post number two. She, she, she got, it. I think, a lot of it out in, in this one. And when I read this, I knew immediately I had failed uh, these students pretty seriously. Um, she said, after she says, I'm going to get real for a couple of paragraphs, I took this class because I wanted to address my relationship with the idea of climate change. I think I was somewhere between Margaret Klein's description of guilt and grief. The problem seemed so enormous. And then I started doing the readings for this class. And every problem that we learn about stresses me out so much. It feels uncomfortable just to go on with my normal uh, student life. I want to do something about climate change. I want to change the values of Western humans and bring media attention to the people who are experiencing the first real destructive effects of climate change. But an individual has almost no influence. And then skipping to the end, I can recycle and use reusable containers and take short showers. But does that add, what does that add up to? It's quite stressful being so uninfluential. And you can see some of the problems here. You really see all of these challenges that I uh, was introducing earlier here. Um, there's the problem of working through guilt and grief and a lack of hope. There's this problem of individual agency because there's no clear path forward, uh, no next step. And there is also this problem of an inability to imagine how I, as just one person, can have any positive effect. And I have to tell you that when I read this, it felt horrible. I, I thought about how I can explain this. And, and the best I can think of is, you know, imagine you leave your house, you drive like half an hour to work or the office, you settle in, and you realize you left the stove on with the pot on top of, of the stove, right? That's what it felt like, the sort of sinking in the pit of my stomach. And I realized I had done something uh, pretty horrible for a teacher to do. I had uh, taken students who were relatively happy, if you know, ignorant of, of these problems, and I had shown them all of these problems and taken them up to the very edge, and they were very serious about it, all the way up to the, the very edge of sort of like grief and despair. And instead of at the very least pulling them back a step or two, um, and even better showing them a path elsewhere, somewhere better, um, I just sort of left them there because I didn't know what to do. Um, and it, it really changed everything. I knew I could never teach this class the same way again. Uh, it had to be redesigned. And uh, that's sort of what set me on this path eight years ago. Um, several students commented on this, essentially saying they felt exactly the same way. And all of them were very generous. Nobody blamed me for anything. They all said at the very least, now that we feel horrible, we can talk about it together. We know that's not really gonna do anything, but it makes us feel better. At least we have that, okay? All right, so I went back to the drawing board um, and thought, Really, the first thing 
we need to work on is this agency problem. Uh, my thought being, we need to at least get moving, have, find some excuse to do something, um, even if we don't know what that is. And so um, I, I started talking with my students and I realized that they, they had a perspective on things that were, it was similar to mine. Um, and I think uh, Tim Ingle really nailed, uh, hit the nail on the head when he, when he called this the building perspective. It's the idea that before you do anything of importance, you need to make sure you're ready. You have to plan everything out, you have to practice, you have to get everything in place, and then you can start doing the important thing. And maybe it's the way we do education in the United States, but uh, a lot of students sort of thought of the university as the four years where you get everything straight, you figure it out, right? And there's this idea that life is going to be the simple execution of this plan, especially adulthood. In adulthood, you're going to execute this plan that you build up in university, like sort of building a house from a blueprint, or at least how architects imagine a house is built from a blueprint. It's actually not that straightforward. Um, and there are some problems with this. Uh, one is, uh, by the time you figure out a really good plan, the world's changed, right? And the plan doesn't apply anymore and so forth. And so students knew this building metaphor didn't work, but they didn't have anything to replace it with. And so here we just went with Tim Ingold's idea of wayfaring, um, which uh, it, 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 he built up this idea first, the dwelling perspective, and then uh, wayfaring, um, which really is just this action of traveling on foot. Um, and he uses it to talk about how some indigenous peoples uh, teach their youngsters about the environment. So instead of like many of us sitting in front of a PowerPoint presentation, they take them out into the environment and move through it. And as the world opens up to them in different ways, um, they'll draw the attention of the youngsters to things that are important, and they move through the environment and learn as the world opens up to them. So we thought this might be a good metaphor um, for action and for learning. Rather than learning happening in the classroom where we get everything straight, learning about the world is more like, um, you learn about the world by, by moving through it and it opens up to you, right, in the same way. So the idea is you take a first step, and it might be a really, really naive first step. It might even be a terrible idea. Um, but you take the first step and in doing so, you learn new things, you meet new people. And with that new information, you can reevaluate the way you thought the world was and what your goal is. Um, and it might be that you need to change your direction a little bit, right? Um, and you do that sort of over and over and over again. The world opens up, you learn new things, you meet new people. Um, you get new opportunities. And pretty soon you go from this sort of building perspective to something that's more like reality, um, this wayfaring perspective. Um, and students have really run with this. And this is probably the most successful um, metaphor I've ever introduced into a class. In fact, I use it in another class as well, uh, one I teach on professionalism or professionalization, I should say. And Students really latch onto it. It sort of makes sense, except for one sort of misunderstanding. Some students think I'm saying that wayfarers don't plan, and that's not true. Wayfarers can be like fantastic planners. It's just uh, we don't hold the plans too tightly, right? We're willing to reevaluate as we learn more um, and so forth. And so um, <clears throat> this became something that, that, that students in the class came to rely on. And so there's, I, I have this quote here from Cheyenne, uh, who was a student um, in 2018. And I put it up because she was having a really rough time starting her project. Um, she, she knew that she wanted to help some people that she had lived with. So she lived in, uh, in a community of farmers. Um, in Southeast Asia, and she knew she wanted to help them, but she didn't know how, she couldn't imagine a way, like a mechanism for getting this done. And she, so she wrote something that I think is just perfect. She, she wrote, I'm not sure how to begin, period. I will begin anyway, by doing the following next week. I will meet with people who also care about my friends 
This has perhaps been the best part of the Wayfaring experience thus far, finding others who want to join me, right? And this is exactly what we were hoping, like to just get us moving, to feel like we could do something. Um, and so with that um, new sort of structural metaphor in place, um, I tried to rebuild the whole class around that um, in those earlier days. And so uh, I kept the blogging assignment, but instead of making the blog something where students just engage with readings, the blog became a place to document a project, right, a wayfaring project, and the readings became infrastructural. They were no longer the focus of the course, but they were there to support the projects. Um, we read this thing and we ask, how can it help us uh, with our projects? And the projects had three requirements. The first one was stu that students had to pick something they cared about, right? Something that was important to them. Um, number two, it had to be something that was threatened by the Anthropocene, right? Which is, uh, they felt that was intimidating at first, and then we did more reading, and it's such an umbrella term. You can sort of, almost anything is threatened, right? Um, and three, they had to go out and do something about it. They had to try to do something to protect or help this thing that they cared about. And as much as possible, they had to try to do it along with other people, not just by themselves, at the very least along with their classmates. And so we had like so many great projects that came out of those earlier classes. Um, this one was done by a student of mine, Kenzie. Um, she was really fascinated by uh, the, the beef industry and its environmental impacts. And she thought, well, in Kansas, I'm not gonna succeed by telling people to not eat beef. And she got really playful with it. It was almost like a serious, it's like a joke almost, but a serious, serious joke um, where she said, I'm going to tell people to eat bugs and beef, right? If they're eating bugs, they're not gonna eat as much beef. And she thought, what can I do in challenging these social norms? And she actually launched a company out of my class called Edamorphosis, where she raised mealworms, made mealworm flour. And she brought these fantastic, uh, mealworm protein cookies to our class and passed them out to like freshmen and stuff. And it was really, really cool. And then she took this project and made it into her PhD project at the University of California where she's still working on it. Um, and then Erica, she was an ethical vegan, uh, still is as far as I know. And her project started out as like a, a critique of factory farm beef. And that sort of rippled through all the way to the end. Uh, but then she did something I was really proud of, uh, very much in the spirit of K-State anthropology. Um, she started wondering, like, how can how can somebody kill and eat an animal? So she went, she started talking to hunters in uh, the local student hunting organization. And she was so fascinated that they co-organized this public event where vegans could talk to hunters. And they had, you know, some things they disagreed on, but some surprising areas of overlap when they talked about sustainability um, and so forth. Um, such a surprising project, uh, given where it started. And then Abby, um, she decided to do some urban foraging. And this is one of her pictures. It probably doesn't look very appetizing, but <laughs> this is one of the places, an uh, alley in, in Manhattan, Kansas, where she did some foraging. And uh, she asked fascinating questions. She would like go into people's yards and say, hey, you have all these weeds growing around, can I pick them and eat them, right? And then she started thinking, is this safe to do? Like, are people spraying their yards? Is the city spraying uh, for, for pests and for weed control? And so she had to figure that out. Um, and then she started asking questions about like, hey, what is a weed anyways? Is it just a plant that it grows somewhere that we don't want? And why don't we want that? Um, and then if I'm urban foraging, can't we also cultivate in the urban space better and grow more food instead of grass? Um, and she sort of co-organized this big potluck, um, which is really fantastic that year. And so we had some partial successes at least, but as students did these projects, even the ones they thought were sort of successful and they were really proud of it, it still didn't have this impact at the level that they thought it should, right? And in my experience uh, with undergraduates here at K-State, they're kind of hard on themselves. The activists I know think in terms of decades, right? Um, but 
but my students are ambitious. They really want this stuff to happen. They, they want to get it done and they get really disappointed when it, it doesn't work out the way they think. And so we had this way of cultivating agency, but we still didn't have a good way of imagining how our actions, even if we have a relatively successful semester long project, how that can have bigger scale, scale effects. So that became the next problem we worked on. And if so, if the first metaphor was wayfaring, um, the next bit of metaphor work was with seed planting. Um, and the idea for this came from uh, the fact that when we think about scale, and especially when students think about scale, it's very like geometric or mechanical, and it's really hard to understand how our action can have bigger effects, right, than what we sort of put into it. And so I turn to, if we turn to Tim Ingold in the first part, or uh, the last part, uh, in this one, we turn to Elena Bennett. Um, she is uh, an ecosystem ecologist, um, but she also has done a, a lot of work on um, global development scenarios. And she's become really critical about how we tell stories about the future. Um, for one, she, she thinks that uh, they're far too negative and that, that can have uh, sort of some bad effects, right? Like self-fulfilling effects, uh, sort of like if you're driving a car and you look one direction, even if you don't wanna go that direction, you tend to turn that way. And so she thinks we need better ways of tell, telling stories. And some of the problems with these big global scenarios is that they're not really realistic, right? They might have uh, paint a really clear picture of some endpoint, usually good, bad, and some mix, um, but they don't really give concrete, immediate steps, detailed steps of how to get to any, any of those, right? So uh, they leave us sort of confused as to what to do next. Um, they also don't paint a very realistic picture of what human humanity's place uh, in, in the world. So we're either techno gods, uh, for example, or we're a plague upon the earth, um, rather than trying to cultivate some sense of maybe dignified humility, right, in relation to the rest of, of the world. Um, and they also tend, because they're caricatures, uh, not to inspire us very much. And so she thinks, our stories about the future needs to sort of be the opposite of that. They need to show realistic pathways, not just endpoints, show a, a different place for humanity, and, and they need to inspire us somewhat. And so the question is, where do we turn for uh, the inspiration for these stories? And here she does something that I think is really smart, um, and it's definitely my instinct as an anthropologist. She goes out and she looks at what real people are doing, um, real projects, that bring together human well-being um, and sustainability um, in some novel way, and in doing so, um, show some potential or some actual ability to scale out and up and connect with other projects and so forth. And she calls these seeds of a good anthropocene. Uh, she and her colleagues have cataloged in sort of like a seed bank um, hundreds and hundreds of these projects. And you can go to their website, Seeds of a Good Anthropocene, and you can read through them. And the hope is in reading through these real projects of what people are doing, um, we're, we'll start to get a sense of what real concrete steps look like for making the world a better place um, and also reaching the scale of solutions that we need. Uh, and so in class, we go through that. Um, students take uh, cases home, they read them, and then we discuss them. Um, and then I present some cases uh, from my field work in the South Pacific, uh, and uh, we do some others as well. Now, uh, one in particular, and I didn't expect this, but one in particular is sort of the most engaging for them, and it's actually one that's not part of the seed bank. It's um, the story of Scott Harrison and Charity Water. Uh, charity Water is just what it sounds like. It's a charity that tries to bring clean water to people around the world. 
Um, and what I think they like about it is that Scott Harrison is a master storyteller at this point in his career. He's really captivating, especially in the long format. Um, but in telling the story, what makes it so great, I think, for students is he doesn't try to make himself look like he always had the answers. It's very much a wayfarer's journey. So he starts out um, as a nightclub promoter, and he feels like he has no meaning in his life. And then he can't really get a job doing anything meaningful, so he volunteers uh, to take pictures uh, for a development NGO. And then he realizes that water is this big problem, and he decides he's going to do something about it, but has no idea what to do. So he says, I'm going to start a charity, and everybody tells him, don't start a charity. Nobody trusts charities. And so he says, well, okay, what would a charity that people trust look like? So he comes up with this new infrastructure. Um, and then along the way, all these accidents start, start what look like accidents start happening. It's big partners like Saks Fifth Avenue and uh, American Express, Barack Obama becomes part of the mix somehow. And very clearly for students, they can see this is way beyond this one person who started this whole thing on his friend's couch, right? Um, and all of a sudden, in telling that story, it becomes clear that uh, things can grow far and above our own individual efforts. And so putting the story in the context of this organic, lively metaphor seems to make sense, right? They seem to sort of get how we can imagine from the individual scale to not just a dystopian future, but something more like a good future. Now, uh, they did some really surprising things with the metaphor in class, though. So. Um, they did seem to come away with what I hoped that they can are, are more able to imagine how a better world can grow out of their individual efforts. But they started saying some other things that I didn't expect. So we were talking about it and they said, well, if we have seed planters, maybe not everybody needs to be a seed planter. Maybe some people can be the seed waterers. Maybe some people can tend to little saplings as they're growing up and so forth. Um, and what they were doing is actually critiquing that last iteration of the class um, where everybody was required to have their own project. Everybody was required to be a founder, right, of some new initiative, really. Um, and they were saying, look, uh, look, dude, Dr. Durbin, uh, not everybody should be expected to do this thing, right? Some people have other things they want to do with their life. And maybe we can live a good life supporting all of these seeds and doing that consciously. And I thought that was really, really smart and really great. Um, and then the other thing they said, which I thought was really awesome, uh, was that we need a diversity of seeds, right? The idea being that if we were doing what we need to do, right, um, if we were planting the things that we needed to plant for a better Anthropocene, we'd have a better Anthropocene right now. So we need to look to the places where people are looking. We need to look to the margins and the liminal spaces. And we need to look to, uh, you know, the, the forgotten, the socially forgotten and, and oppressed. And this is where we need to take people seriously and see what they're doing. And they're raising this question uh, that Abby sort of anticipated in her urban uh, foraging project, which is, uh, maybe we're not, maybe we're talking about planting what people think of now as weeds, right? We're, we're talking about cultivating things that right now we don't think uh, should belong, right? Maybe we need to look, uh, be more creative about these seeds. And again, here we find students this is partly why this is such a different class. They anticipate things. They get there faster than I do in, in some ways. Um, and I'm just sort of catching up. Okay, so we sort of have done some work on this problem of agency, this, some metaphor work on this problem of imagination. Um, the hardest one for me, and we're right now at the horizontal edge of the class, um, is dealing in some way with the grief and anxiety, the negative emotions that go along with all of this. And we've confronted it from the beginning almost. After that first part of the class, um, we always spend a week or two just trying to work through and recognize our emotions about things like climate change, right? So we do some readings, and then we do this assignment that students always really like called 
uh, the Anthropocene playlist, where they put together a list of songs along with listening notes about how they feel about the Anthropocene, and they can pick anything they want. Um, and they can give it a narrative arc, like I felt this way, and then I, I felt this way, and then, you know, this is how I'm feeling now. And we share it, and we all listen to them together, and so forth. Um, but that's very different from trying to think, okay, now what do we do with this? What would, what would something like uh, an appropriate hope be right in the age of planetary crisis. Um, and really, um, I've, I've been stalled out on this. Um, and the solution so far has been not to deal with it directly, like confront our emotions about it. Um, but then we just sort of do what I always do with students when I don't know what to do when facing difficult things. And that's just to try to be a human being with, with them, right? Um, just hang out, not as their teacher necessarily. Um, and that's what we were trying to do in this picture. Uh, some students, they actually organized this potluck. Uh, I brought my family, Jack and Avery, our twin boys got passed around from, from temporary auntie and uncle to te temporary auntie and uncle. And uh, we got had some foraged foods. One of our indigenous students brought food that um, they make at home uh, with their family. And we didn't talk about any of the world's problems. We just enjoyed the here and now with each other. And that's been as far as I've been able to get for a long time. Um, and I think now is the time to try to tackle this problem of hope, okay? Um, and so that's what I'm going to try to do now, but I don't know if it's successful. So the first place um, I sort of stop or pause is with Leslie Head's really cool book, uh, published in 2016, Hope and Grief in the Anthropocene. And she says something that I think, a couple of things that are so smart about this to reorient how we think about hope. Um, the argument I make, she says, about hope and where it might be found consists in decoupling it from the emotion of optimism. I think this is really important because I think that's the model of hope students have. And when they can't cultivate some sense of optimism or progress where the future becomes uh, where the future is the good we have now gets better and we have less bad stuff. Um, that, that doesn't seem to always be possible, right? They can't always muster that sense of optimism. Um, but also in the second part, I think could be seriously underrated. Hope savers the life and world we have, not the world as we wish it to be. Um, that's hard. If we have to find hope in the way the world is, then that means we have to look squarely at the hardest things, uh, at tragedy. And here, because it's part of a story that students already listen to um, and know, and it has a big impact on them, I'm going to turn to a small three-minute story that Scott Harrison tells as part of this big story of Charity Water. Um, a little bit of a warning. He talks about the suicide of a teenage girl. So if you want, uh, if, if that is something that you can't handle right now, just uh, mute your computer um, and come back in about four minutes, okay? As, as things had it, I, I happened to be in a $5 a night hotel room in Ethiopia. I was with a few donors, a small group. I was sitting in the kitchen of this hotel and the hotel owner walks out, recognizes me, because we've been doing work in this region for a while, and just sits down and uh, unprompted starts telling me a story about a woman who lived in his village in a remote area, a uh, village of about 3,000 people. And he said all the women used to walk for water for eight hours a day, and they would have these heavy clay pots that they would carry on their back. And he said one day, you know, one of the women in my village um, named Leda Kiros, he had her name, walks back into the village and she slips and falls and she breaks her clay pot and all the water spills out into the dust. And he said, she hung herself and she didn't go back for more water. He said, we, we found her body swinging from this tree in our village. And then I remember he kind of paused to watch the story's effect on us. And he said, the work you're doing is important. You know, keep it up. And he just disappeared. <laughs> you know, I remember sitting there with a group of five people <laughs> like, like what? Like you got, you feel like you got hit with a ton of yeah. bricks, and then you start doubting it. You know, is that story really true? <laughs> right. Just tell the international donors yeah. a sad story, make us feel great about the work that we're doing. Um, but I just couldn't really shake 
the idea, like that picture of a woman mm -hmm. who had slipped and fallen, you know, like all of us have done, yeah. and was in such despair in her living conditions that she tied a noose around her neck, climbed a tree, and then jumped. Mm -hmm. So uh, I sent our partners out to the village. And I said, you know, can you go and go to this village and tell me, you know, first of all, did anyone named Leta Kiros actually yeah. live there? Is it true? And I don't know, a couple of weeks later, I got an email from one of our partners saying, yeah, we went to the village and, you know, sadly, it's a true story. We saw a grave. Um, we met the family. So then I asked my wife, I said, well, I want to go and live there for a week. And long story short, you know, I went to the village. I lived there for a week. Um, I wound up meeting the priest that gave her funeral. I saw the pile of rocks behind the church that was her grave. I met her mom. I met her friend that walked with her that day. Um, I wound up writing about it uh, on Medium and, and you know, writing about the experience and, and seeing the tree. And, you know, it's kind of this, um, it, it's a frail tree. And I didn't know before I went into the, the, uh, the village that she was 13. Wow. So that was a huge shock for me. I, th I was expecting an old lady, but I was kind of imagining this hunched 60-year-old woman who had walked for water her entire life. It was a 13-year-old girl. It was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And I remember through, you know, all this through translators asking her best friend why she thought she actually did it. You know, why did Leta Kiros hang herself? And her best friend said, you know, she would have been overcome with shame because she'd broken the clay pot and she'd spilled the water. All right, there's a lot to unpack here. The first is, uh, if we're following what I think Leslie had to say, if, if we're going to have hope appropriate to planetary crisis, we have to find it in tragedy. But it can't be a kind of hope that throws up its hands and says, well, all's well that ends well. Um, the means justify the ends. Uh, now, uh, as Scott Harrison goes on, you know, he says they, they put a well in uh, that village what the women don't walk the water anymore. Um, what, whatever an appropriate hope is, it can't be a hope that says, well, so I guess everything was worth it, right? Uh, that's, you know, denial, right? Um, it has to be one that takes it seriously and doesn't minimize the tragedy of reality. Um, the other thing is that there's this subtle critique of the metaphor of seed planting in the story because you know it says that we can plant these seeds and nurture them and they grow into these trees and we might hang ourselves from them nevertheless we could go through all of this and we might fail this is a real possibility right we might fail um so there's something in this but i didn't realize how much uh, until i listened to it again and it sent sort of tripped a couple of wires. I had these faint memories, right? Um, that this, this story sort of uh, brought up for me. So I tracked them down. And the first one comes from this classic ethnography by anthropologist E.E. E. Evans Pritchard about witchcraft um, uh, and the Azandi. And, you know, he explains in the book that um, the Azandi, when they experience misfortune, especially extraordinary misfortune, they will blame it on witchcraft, right? And so he gives actually the example of potter, a master potter makes a bunch of uh, pots, puts them in the kiln and they break and he can't find any imperfections. And he's like at the height of his skill, they'll, they'll say he was bewitched. But he gives a handful of examples that are never a candidate for uh, witchcraft as an explanation, meaning, the blame, you can't externalize the blame, right, onto, onto something else. And one of those cases is when a girl breaks her water pot, right? And instead of saying, well, it was just an accident or you were bewitched, she gets berated by her parents for stupidity, right? There's something deeper in this kind of story, the structure of the story, than I initially thought, right? Because it's an utmost tragedy. It's a really nowhere to go uh, from there. And then I trip this other memory, which um, it actually comes from like a really odd source, um, a marginal fringe part of Christian literature, largely considered to be um, probably heretical and certainly uh, repressed uh, by the mainline church. And we find it in this book called The Gospel of Thomas. And it's a parable that you don't find anywhere in the canonical gospels. And it goes like this. The kingdom, so we can think of here, 
you know, this is something we're hoping for, whatever that is, we're hoping for it. So this is supposed to be a story about hope, what hope is like. The kingdom is like a certain woman who is carrying a jar full of meal while she was walking on the road, still some distance from home. The handle of the jar broke and the meal emptied out behind her on the road. She did not realize it. She had noticed no accident. When she reached her house, she set the jar down and found it empty. And that's the end. There's no explanation. The story doesn't go on. That is the picture of hope, right? That's being given here. And I think uh, the original hearers would have contrasted this with the story uh, of Elijah, who uh, is fed miraculously from a jar of meal that doesn't run out. God intervenes. You can have hope in this external intervention from somewhere else. Not so, right, in this story. And so I went down this like little rabbit hole, actually a big rabbit hole, because I'm not a biblical scholar at all by any means. What are parables about? Like, what the heck's going on here? And so I looked at some of the work uh, by people like uh, Bernard, Brandon, Scott, who argue something interesting, which I didn't know, which is that parables were actually uh, critiques of the dominant culture. They had the same structure as, uh, as myth, the sort of dominant organizing story. Um, they used the same myth themes, like little building blocks of the myth, but they would invert one or change the order in a way that would sort of bring the dominant myth crashing down around it. Um, and so this got me thinking um, about another one from broken jars to uh, weeds. Um, this is a reconstruction of a uh, parable of the mustard seed, which some people might be familiar with. It says the kingdom, again, this hoped for thing, the kingdom is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a great shrub and put forth large branches so the birds of heaven can make nests in its shade. Okay, so this is interesting because it gets immediately captured uh, back up, caught back up into, into mythic thinking by early Christians. Um, and you, it, it's almost synonymous with the story of like Christian triumphal, triumphant, triumphal, uh, triumphantalism, excuse me. Um, so that's not what original hearers would have probably heard because um, according to ritual law at the time, it was sort of illegal to plant mustard in a garden. Mustard was considered an invasive weed, a garden, uh, had to be a, was a place where everything had its proper place. It was orderly, right? And so uh, early listeners would have heard the kingdom, this hope for thing, will look a lot to you like corruption. It will look a lot to you like the margins are invading your nice, neat world, right? Um, this is where maybe we need to look for hope. And what I love about all of this is that Leslie had in her book, she has a whole chapter on weeds, right? And how weeds are this wonderful place to look for hope in the Anthropocene. And she says, weeds may offer hope in their capacity to be healers of broken landscapes. I would say both metaphorically and actually, like what happens when um, we disturb things, right? Uh, we, we disturb the soil and what comes in as the Band-Aid? right? What we consider weeds, right? And why are they weeds? Well, because we just don't want them there, okay? And so um, we're at the very edges of where uh, we're th where the class is at this point, um, maybe far beyond how I would talk to students about it even. Um, but it gets me to this place where I can make some modest proposals, some early proposals for how we might think about hope um, in, in uh, teaching about planetary crisis you know, as a way of dealing with our grief. Uh, something like this. The hope we find in reality of broken jars and weedy invasions is more like the ability to act as if a better future can grow out of any reality, even our utmost failures, without diminishing or justifying the tragedy from which a better future might grow. And without insisting that a better, that better conform to our dominant conceptions of it. So uh, there you go. I'm at the very edges of, of the class now, and I welcome your comments and questions and thinking through it with you. Thank you.
Holy moly. Yeah, I'm a little freaked out because I just turned in an article like a day ago that was called Writing from the Wreckage. And it was about like hopeful futures for higher education. And I feel like I may need to go retract it and redo the whole ending <laughs> based on your, your talk. I think I was gesturing towards a lot of what you're doing, but you said it so, so beautifully. Um, so I know that some folks, you know, may just be here for the hour. Other folks may be able to stay just a little bit longer. Um, we can have Trevor a little bit past uh, five o'clock, but I would love for people to have a chance to share their reflections or ask their questions. And I wanna um, say a particular welcome to our students who are here, um, that it can feel kind of scary to unmute and ask a question, um, but we'd really love to hear your voices because many of you are, are studying this stuff right now and, um, and responding to it. So I will encourage anyone who's a student here to take a minute and think about a question that you might want to ask. Um, and when anybody has a question, if you can just go ahead and use the um, reaction down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see reactions. And if you use the raise hand reaction, we'll be able to call on you um, uh, in due time. So with that, I'll open it up to anybody because our students will likely take a minute or two to think of their questions. Um, so with that, does anybody want to kick us off with a, a reflection or a question? And go ahead, Flory. Um, I have more of a reflection, I guess, than a um question, but I I had to um change my major because I was an ESP major and I just found it so depressing, honestly. And I know that my professors did try to, you know, put some light into it, but it was just really hard. And this was really refreshing to like know that there are people really trying to to show that there are like positive sides so it's not just like oh my gosh the world is ending you know <laughs> but yeah I thought this was this was really interesting and, and powerful thank you yeah thank you for that comment um it is super hard I actually um I I cannot spend most of my time thinking about it um and uh I, I wish I had something more productive to say, <laughs> um, except maybe, you know, um, you might not be one of these people that that has it within them, and I'm not, to spend all of our time thinking about it, um, but maybe you could be one of these seed waters when you see something, um, some, you know, you can support and nurture um, as you have time and as you have the capacity um what other people uh might be doing more directly i i think there needs to be room for everybody for sure yeah good comment um eli go ahead uh hi um thank you for your talk trevor i found this very moving and um almost like a during your talk about charity water whom i I donate to, and I was really hoping that there was nothing bad in there. I was like, this ended up really well for me. Um, but um, I'm familiar with the story, and that's the first time I heard the story of the the girl, um, but I found it really moving, and I kind of, during, while he was talking and while you were talking after, kind of remembered why I came to school and, and, and wanted to further my education is because, like, I truly believe that I can make change in the world, and I think that somewhere in between then and now I got bogged down with all the like th the mental chaos and the planetary chaos that happens every day and that is constantly on my mind um but I think this talk was good for me because it like one of your students said if I don't know where to begin just start anyway because there is a community out there and there is people that want to do the same things and have the same ideas that I do and there's community out there and I don't know, this talk was good for me because it made me want to begin and it made me remember why I began in the first place. So uh, thank you. No, thank you. That was uh, really wonderful to hear. Thank you for that comment. I'm going to have to stop moderating soon because I will be crying too much. Uh, but like, it's you know, chopping happy. onions. Yeah, that was be beautifully said. Um, Bryce, go ahead. 
Yeah. Um, so I just want to say I sort of am that person who can't really get away from thinking about all the bad stuff. And um, I, I have a really hard time with it. And uh, I actually, last week, I went and talked to a professor that I really look up to that I've been learning a lot from. And I asked him, like, how do you keep it together? How do you know all, you know, all this stuff about, you know, capitalism's effect on the world and et cetera? And how do you handle it? And um, he told me that it's really difficult sometimes. And, you know, his wife, like my fiance is constantly saying like, you know, you, you focus on all the negative and there's so much positive in the world. Um, but he told me that he thinks it's important because even if we feel powerless and like we can't do something about it, um, just knowing is, is something. It at least means something to the people who have gone through it. And, you know, the more people who know, the more people that will be able to stop things in the future. So, you know, you guys are doing helpful work. You're doing something good. Don't feel like you're hurting students by opening them up to painful concepts. I, I appreciate that, Bryce. Um, uh, the honesty, uh, especially, and uh, the affirmation as well. Um, you know, I, I, I've thought about, I, I kind of suspect that this narrative that we're powerless and can't do much of anything about it, I, I can't prove it, but I, I suspect that this is like, part of the capitalist ideology anyways, right? Like you read all of these mainstream articles about, yeah, a, a person, an individual can't do anything um, uh, or uh, barring that, yeah, go out and recycle. Uh, I saw one the other day about how much carbon letting your car idle produces, right? And this is all ideal, ideological, right? Um, why is it that we find it so impossible to think about the good impacts we can have at scale, but uh, really easy to think about the, the bad impacts we have at scale. So I wonder, you know, some kind of hope to me seems like a radical act, even possibly. And, um, you know, I say go out and be hopeful, Bryce, and stick it to the man. <laughs> uh, that reminds me of a call I was on earlier today um, with the former chair of the New Hampshire higher education council or something. And we were talking about how New Hampshire is last in the nation for public funding of higher ed. And he was telling me that um, because we are so far back in funding that it contributes to our legislature, legislature continuing to defund us because even if they gave us a, sh okay, I was gonna say a bad word, a lot of money, it would go into the black hole of how far behind we are and it would barely help. And that becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. Whereas on the other side, we've got all this great evidence that if we were to invest, we could truly seed and rebuild so many things relatively easily. But so one of the things I really loved about your talk was that sense of how the awakening, you know, the, the, I think you talked about it when you were talking about um, sort of in indigenous environmental science, like the opening up to the possibility of what's right in front of you. And I feel like that's kind of a piece of hope, like Bryce was talking about, there's hope in knowing, mm -hmm. because you're sort of poised to say, oh, it doesn't have to be like this, you know, I, I see that we've created this in some ways and we could perhaps uncreate it in some way. Mm -hmm. um, very moving. Other um, thoughts or questions or comments for or with Trevor? Um, I see Abby in the chat, yeah. Maybe the good Anthropocene isn't called the Anthropocene at all. 
fill in the blank scene. Yeah, we, we have this conversation uh, every year in the class where we go over some of the critiques of the term. And um, so I, I get to the point where I, I leave it up to them. Are we going to keep using this or are we going to use something else and scrap it all together? And so far, they've always said, OK, we're glad we know the problems with it, but it's out there and we're going to just uh, we think we, we think we could do, get more work done, just like not focusing on renaming this thing and 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 and, and do something else. Um, however, I have a really hard time convincing them that the work like that it actually makes a difference what we call something right um which i also think is true um so yeah um yeah the capitalo scene cthulhu scene for sure i don't know if you guys i, I will certainly put in a plug for it here because you know you are the demographic everybody here but um our book our our university book club read the overstory uh, fairly recently, and um, it's a you know it's a book about trees, right? That's what that's what the press is. It's about trees, um, and I'm not going to give anything away, but I will say the ending of that book reminds me a lot of your talk, and whether or not you find the ending the most depressing thing or the most hopeful thing is a little bit about I think how much you're willing to let go of the idea that we need to recreate the world as it used to be, you know, as opposed to wandering into something that's going to look quite different. Um, but yeah. if you are a, a student of this stuff, you may, and it's a, it's a long book, but don't let it scare you if you haven't read it, because it's really a, a very easy read in some ways. Um, it's called The Overstory by, what's his name, guys? Like Richard something? Ma Matthew just mouthed it but they're Richard Powers <laughs> if you're interested yeah yeah and I, and I certainly didn't mean to suggest that that conversation was not important about um what we call this thing we're in I if you didn't notice I preferred to say planetary crisis because I feel like that's more direct um maybe um and it also has its problems so yeah I certainly think that's an important conversation to have um I don't know I wonder if anybody has a preference, I could I could I could rename the course for sure. <laughs> Our uh, program coordinator loves to do the paperwork on that sort of thing. I'm sure <laughs> they do. Um, Martha and then Abby. Um, so I'm just going to say this because it's it's been like eating at me the whole time listening to you, and it's so out of left field. But if I don't like say it out loud, it's going to continue to eat at me. Last night, I have a kid who's a senior in high school, and last night. Um, they were not feeling great and needed a little bit of help. And so I was helping them work through an English assignment. And the English assignment was to read the, this essay, the essay by Arthur Miller, Tragedy and the Common Man, which I'm sure I read in high school once, but I can't remember reading it. And although I was an English major, I only read things written like prior to the year 1650. So <laughs> I had never, I've never gone back and revisited this if I did read it as a high schooler. So it was really kind of new to me. And the whole time you've been talking, it's just been reminding me of his argument about tragedy as hopeful, as opposed to tragedy as despair and pessimistic. And, and, and they and I were trying to like kind of grapple with this when we were working on it last night. And of course, like it was, it's fascinating to me as kind of a theory, but we don't live a, a theory, right? We live in the real world, but it still feels to me like there's something there that's linked to what you're talking about, which is that even in tragedy, what we see is a space for agency, right? We see, we see character, well, his argument is that true tragic characters have some space within which they can act. And, and that's where the hope is. Right. And so I just, it, I, again, it just keeps resonating with me as I think about this. You know, that that's super fascinating. It actually takes me back to um, somebody, I don't know if anybody reads this guy anymore, Victor Frankl, who, um, he was a psychiatrist. He was in a concentration camp uh, um, and so forth. And what he would talk about like spirituality, but, um, but, up at, at a person's soul but what he meant was exactly what you were talking about that in the worst of circumstances there seems to be some freedom that we have to do something like to choose our attitude or something like that and yeah man search for meaning yeah absolutely uh abby and uh and it makes me wonder if 
we're running up against the limitations of our disenchanted, the dis disenchanted language we use in the humanities, right? Um, well, actually, the humanities are better than <laughs> with it than most. Um, but uh, you know, there are people right now experimenting with re-enchantment. I think um, Jane Bennett is one. Um, you know, when we're but the re reason I bring it up is the great re religious traditions all seem to say the same thing, which is hope is in tragedy, right? And you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to get anywhere if you don't accept the reality of what's right in front of your face to the point where my favorite definition of prayer, whatever that is, is a long loving look at the real, right? You know, if that if that's how we're uh, so, so maybe, and I know Bruno Latour has experimented with a more enchanted language as well around this sort of stuff. I, I wonder if that isn't the next step um, to some kind of freedom, inner freedom to deal with this sort of thing. I don't know. Uh, it's a really good point, though. Go ahead, Abby. Does anyone else want to talk before I go? You're next in line. They, they, can, okay. they can queue up. Um, I, know, I was just going to ask um, if you or if anyone really wants to talk about this. I was just talking about this very subject, this the difficulty of teaching these topics um, with a group of faculty at Colby last night. And we were talking about the place of critique mm -hmm. um, in environmental humanities. And I think this could be extrapolated to environmental studies more broadly. Um, critiquing something like the Anthropocene um, or critiquing a term like sustainability and then sort of stopping, right? Because in my discipline, we do a lot of critique, but environmental studies, I think has an imperative to action and praxis. And I hear you talking about agency in terms of action. Um, so can you talk about the relationship between critique um, and even just slowing down and thinking, because I'm thinking about Tim Morton's work and how he says that what's missing from ecological um, awareness is thinking itself, mm -hmm. that like, what we're missing is thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so that relationship between critique and thinking and slowing down and reflecting, and then the imperative to, to action right. um, in environmental studies and how you manage that relationship. Okay, so this is, okay, this is such a good question. And I wish, as with most things, I had an original answer, but I'm going to have to draw on other people's creativity here. Um, so we actually just had um, Dominic Boyer and Samiti Howe out here to talk about some of their work. Um, and we had such a wonderful time. Um, and one thing they, they said, and as soon as they said it, I said, oh my gosh, yes, this is, this is the right thing. Um, one of the best things we can do in the Anthropocene is not do a whole bunch of stuff. Right? Like, uh, they, they, you know, they, they call it, you know, they, they talk about low carbon pleasures, right? Um, you know, we're always on the go doing things. If everybody did much less, we'd be much better off from a, a carbon emissions perspective, right? And so there's this idea, yeah, I think, I think Tim's right slowing down and thinking and sitting around and critiquing, if more people were doing that, that in and of itself would, would be something. Like that would be a lot. Um, and so I think you're right. Uh, maybe there is a blind spot there. Um, and I share this blind stop, spot with my students that when we think of agency, we're thinking about going out and doing something. Um, and this I think ties into this other bias that a lot of us have where what we're trying to do is save the world, right? And probably we shouldn't be saving, some things need to be saved, but uh, we, we need a better world, right? So yeah, it's, that's such a good question. Um, I'd have to think, I'm gonna think more about it for sure, yeah. I'm gonna say that was also a fantastic answer. I just, I mean, I don't know if you, that was derivative, but it was, you know, new to me, that was really, it, and of course, it reminds me so much, Abby, of your work on slow interdisciplinarity, um, which, you know, it, I think there's a lot of capitalism lurking, you know, underneath a lot of this stuff, right, whether we're talking about um, education or the environment or whatever. So great. Um, Vahid, go ahead. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Trevor. This was a, a very interesting talk for me, and it was so interesting to see um, topics of grief and hope included in it, and uh, how um, the generation of hope becomes a role for the teacher, actually, which uh, I, haven't, I hadn't heard before. So I thought that was a, a very interesting approach and uh, definitely relevant for the topic. And regarding grief, uh, it's so interesting for me that um, the uh, author of Collapsology, the term that I mentioned before, Pablo Servin, um, goes into this whole dimension of how we have to grieve the world we have lost or that the trajectory indicates we have lost. We're just in the process of finishing up. Uh, and, and so, then the, the issue becomes uh, how do we manage our grief for this world that is past? And then uh, for hope, then the question then becomes what are our sources for hope? And uh, uh, interestingly, in his work, he proposes that mutual assistance and collaboration uh, becoming the new rules for human interactions rather than competition or dominance uh, are uh, significant sources of, of hope. And I would extend that to the idea of community building, which is something that um, I also appreciated from your talk, this idea that we can build community and this can be in the classroom. But of course, since um, I'm also a fan of open education, it also can happen outside the classroom, right? And with the community at large and, that, and, and possibly even society. So then perhaps one source for hope is this process of community building. Uh, so I, I really appreciated all, all those ideas and this expansion of the role of the, the teacher that you mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, you know, I didn't realize the extent to which I didn't know how to live in community until I moved to the to Samoa and uh, later the Cook Islands. Um, and when I came home, like, I don't think I've ever been so depressed in my life, right? Um, I don't think we, most of us, at least in North America, understand the level of isolation we're living in. Um, and it's going to be, you know, we can say community building, but having the skill set to do it is another thing, right? And so now, wouldn't it be great to have... Uh, like a set of courses for four years where you just learn how to live in community and build uh, community. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I wanna go to a comment or question in the chat from Matthew. Uh, Matthew, do you want me to read that or do you wanna unmute and read it? I oh, think I, can, I can unmute. I was just asking about the, the nature of guilt. And I think it's easy for us who are mostly ordinary people to fall into guilt, but, in fact, the 100 richest people in the world could do way more than any, any of us could, and the 10 biggest corporations could do way more than any of us ever could. So I, I think it's worth paying attention to power, and especially when we're, we're beating ourselves up. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I think it is kind of silly that we find it so easy to feel guilty, right, um, and find it so hard to uh, to that other side, right, where uh, we do something and maybe that's going to lead to something good. Um, I used to have this experiment and it may, hopefully it doesn't make anybody angry. It's sort, sort of heretical, maybe. I would ask students to go a week without recycling, right? And none of them have ever been able to do it, thankfully, but um, they all like, they all have to recycle. And I ask them why, and they say, I feel too guilty. And then we talk about you know, might these be sort of rituals that, uh, you know, that are sort of helping us get rid of our little bit of guilt and in that way, keeping us from doing the things we really need to do, right? Um, and I don't want anybody to stop recycling, even though recycling is problematic. Um, uh, but it, it is a way of talking about this. Like, why do we feel so guilty, you know? Um, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And do they ever know if the recycling actually is recycled or is it really just a ritual that we fall through? Because there's plenty of recycling that never makes it to the recycling place. Yeah, so this is usually part of our conversation about like plastic and um, how something like less than 2% is effectively recycled and how recycling was promoted by the plastics industry. So we didn't feel so bad about using it once and throwing it away. Um, 
but even so, I'm not sure, you know, we're in it. It's, I mean, um, but yeah, it, it's usually part of that conversation. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I'm not a big fan of the personalized guilt. This makes me think about the, the, the beauty of the tragic and a little bit about this work I've been doing lately on wreckage. Thanks to you, Matthew, a little bit coming from Baldwin and some coming from Adrian Rich and stuff. But this idea that is so like Vahid, I've worked in open education for a long time. And one of the challenges we have in open is that um, stuff is constantly being open washed. So all the words of open education are um, co-opted and used you know, to very nefarious purposes. And so you think, see words like inclusive and accessible and whatever used um, or open used to indicate almost their exact opposites. Um, so it makes me think that there's something beautiful and valuable in the unpackaged detritus, you know, like the thing that nobody would touch. Um, because you can trust that, you know, no one's trying to sell you something there. And there's a certain kind of, um, of beauty in that. So I've been trying to think about that just in my field, which is more, you know, about higher education. I've been thinking about how do you resist the call to solutionism? How do you resist the call to repackaging? How do you resist the call to clean up? And because so much of the time when you do that, you are just recycling things that go into a dumpster anyway, or you're recycling things that give people permission to pollute on a much larger scale than you could ever possibly pollute, right? Um, so I, I get, I guess I get interested in, you know, like one of the questions you asked is like, how terrifying is it to think that you could work your whole life on something and grow this tree and that tree could in some ways be your own death, right? And one thing I think about is, well, if we stopped working so hard to make everything right and beautiful and perfect, and instead we just acted in community and emergence, you know, with the things that we need and the people that we care for, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I, I think, like you said, we don't have the skills for that, you know, and capitalism so very much wants to undo that kind of, you know, mutual, emergent, community-based work. But um, I'm, I'm really excited about the, the sort of ideas you're, you're putting forward here. I am going to keep recycling, though, even though my um, transfer station has literally like told us at various points, <laughs> it's just going to go into the dumpster, you know, so. Okay. Well, so this reminds me, so I lived in Japan for two years and they, um, every, all the trash gets sorted. Um, so they have raw trash, which is like the scraps from your peelings and, um, the cans and the bottles and things like that. And I was on the train platform and they have a container and you can put your uh, pet bottle in one, your can in the other and so forth. And I looked inside and they were all going to the same receptacle because when it gets where it's going, they sort it anyways. And so I asked my wife's aunt who's Japanese and lives there, why, why if it, do they make us sort it if it all goes to the same place? And she said, well, just imagine if you let people put it all in the same opening. Well, then they'd stop throwing it in there altogether. Like if you make people go one step farther, right? Um, then at least somebody's gonna throw it in the, the right place, right? And so there's like this idea that um, you know, maybe there's something to, to go through the effort, even if in the end, <laughs> I, I know I'm contradicting myself about what I said earlier, but maybe there's something to that for sure. I, I love that. I love all of it. Um, well, we're nearing the end of our time, and I think I want to offer somebody the opportunity um, to have a last reflection or question, um, particularly maybe a student. Are there any students? Um, and feel free, Eric, if you've got any in your classroom there. I know you've got a lot of folks. Um, we're happy to entertain a question from one of them if, if, uh, if you can make it work. But anybody want to be the one to... Give us a closing thought or question. There's a bunch of shy people here, Robin. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, climate meteorology folks are shrinking violets. 
I'll just give it a minute and let let somebody become brave. If anybody's really shy, I can hang out a little bit after if they want a smaller group. This is so peaceful and meditative and I could really just let this go on for another 10 minutes. Um, Bryce, take us home, friend. Uh, I'll just say, you know, thank you for coming and talking with us. You know, I appreciate understanding a little bit of, you know, the teacher side to this issue. You know, I know I think about it all the time, but it's, I don't know, it's interesting or saddening or makes me feel better to understand that you know it's it's affecting you guys also you know it's just another way to know you're not alone when you're thinking about it yeah well thank you again for the comment and i just want to say um most of your teachers really care and most of them really care about you um i don't know if that always gets through to students um and more than you know, actually love you. Um, and, and that's, uh, <laughs> as far as I can tell, more often true than- uh, Eric, I, Eric, I see you just embracing your whole classroom in a big bear hug right there. It's just so lovely. But it really is, right? It's, it's, it's really about how we sit with each other in- in this moment and how we're going to be together in this moment as learners, all of us. I mean, that's really a lot of what your piece is about too, right? Your is about how we are all, all learners as we navigate a world we, we, we don't fully, we can't fully predict. Um, yeah. Um, I think this is just wonderful. Thanks to everybody. And thanks uh, to those in the chat as well. I really enjoyed all the all the comments there. Um, Trevor, I, I just want to say, please keep doing your good work. We're going to need it. Um, I also want to remind folks from Plymouth State um, that we've got lots of uh, faculty members here who are working on these things. Abby's new book is out, which is really in very many ways asking um, questions about sustainability that are just as difficult to grapple with. Um, so from all of your faculty to students, uh, thank you for being here, Trevor, and uh, thanks everybody for coming. And we'll hang out for another minute in case anyone's got a quick question, but otherwise um, I'm going to stop the recording and we'll see y'all later. Thanks. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you.